why reflection happens. The first thing we need to do is set up our problem. And in this case, we're going to have two different mediums and they will meet at the XY plane. So Z equals zero at the interface between the two materials. So medium one extends off to the left to infinity and then medium two extends off to the right out to infinity. And of course, these materials are also of infinite extent in the X and Y directions, but that's very difficult to draw. I've done my best here. We're going to describe our materials with two different parameters. The first one is the impedance. And remember what the impedance does. That describes the balance between the electric and magnetic fields. So if the impedance is one, the electric and magnetic fields will be the same amplitude. The second parameter is refractive index. This is the factor by which a wave slows down inside of a medium. So with refractive index of one, that means we have air or vacuum on the left. Now on the right, we're making these parameters a little bit different because that's a second material. We're going to let the impedance be two. So the electric and magnetic fields will have a slightly different balance and refractive index will be 1.5. So the wave will be slowed down a little bit in medium two compared to medium one. It turns out refractive index really won't play much of a role here. So that's our problem. Now let's apply a wave to this interface. We have a wave, an electromagnetic wave. So it has both an electric and a magnetic field component. In this case, the electric fields are oscillating in the X direction. The magnetic fields have to be perpendicular to that. So they're oscillating in the Y direction. And because the impedance is one, the electric and magnetic fields have the same amplitude. I will mention it's a little bit unrealistic to have an impedance of one. More typically, the impedance will be 200, 300 ohms. But just to keep the numbers simple in this example simple, we're just going to let the impedance be one and two. That's not a problem. So now we ask the question, what happens on the other side of that interface? We know that there is a transmitted wave, but we really don't know what that looks like. So one thing we can do to figure out what the wave on the other side looks like is think about our boundary conditions. Our boundary conditions need the electric and magnetic fields on the left side of that interface to be equal to the electric and magnetic fields on the right hand side of the interface. So our boundary conditions mathematically really are EI equals ET and HI equals HT. So we see that and we can also watch the fields at the interface and we can see that they are continuous going across the interface. So all seems well, right? Well, now let's think about the impedance of the medium. In medium two, the impedance is two. That means the magnetic field has to be half of the electric field and is not half in this case. So let's go ahead and, and make that the case. Now we have the magnetic field, which has half the amplitude of the electric field. That satisfies our impedance condition in medium two. But we have a big problem here. It doesn't seem like we can simultaneously satisfy our boundary conditions and the impedance of the medium. Our boundary conditions want E and H to be equal on either side of the interface, yet the impedance is changing the balance between the two. How do we reconcile it? And in fact, this is sort of an impossible problem. Well, it's not really impossible. The way it's solved is that we have to add a reflected wave into this. So we draw our reflected wave and we look at each of these waves individually and we can see that they all satisfy the impedance. On the left in medium one, the amplitude of the electric and magnetic fields are equal. And on the right hand side of the interface, the magnetic field is half of the electric field. But now we need to think about boundary conditions. Well, it turns out the boundary conditions aren't satisfied on a wave per wave basis. The boundary conditions are satisfied for the total field. So on the left, in fact, we have to look at the sum of the applied or the incident wave plus the reflected wave. So we have an amplitude of one third for the reflected wave 
and an amplitude of one for the applied wave, if we add those together, we get one and one third or four thirds. And that's exactly what the electric field is on the other side of the interface. Well, the amplitude of the magnetic field for the incident wave is one and the reflected wave, it's negative one third. Now, why the negative one third? We have a handedness E cross H that cross product has to point in the direction that the wave is going. The wave has to follow a right hand rule. So for waves traveling in the negative Z direction, the magnetic field has to point in the negative Y direction when the electric field is pointing in the positive X direction. So uh, it changes sign to stay consistent with the handedness. So one minus one third is two thirds on the left side of the interface. And that's exactly what we see on the right hand side of the interface, two thirds. So it's the sum of the waves, the total field on either side of the interface that has to satisfy boundary conditions. The total field does not have to satisfy the impedance. That's just on a wave per wave basis. So when we look at the boundary conditions, incident plus reflected, that is the total field on the left side of the interface. That is what equals the total electric field on the right. And the same thing for the magnetic field. We have to add the incident and reflected and set that equal to the total field on the right, which in this case is just the transmitted wave. Let's do one more visualization where we take the reflected wave, slide it to the right so it overlaps the incident wave. And we can actually look at the sum of those two waves. So we're taking that reflected wave and we're sliding it to the right so that it perfectly overlaps the applied wave. And then what we're looking at, it turns out, is something called a standing wave. And that's a more advanced topic that we won't talk about here, but it doesn't exactly look like a wave because it's a standing wave. It's actually two waves at once traveling in opposite directions. But what we can see when we fully slide that reflected wave to the right is that that standing wave, the total field, is continuous across that interface. So we are satisfying both the impedance of each medium and the boundary conditions. And that's why we have a reflection. There's competing physics that can only be reconciled when there's a reflected wave. Now let's get into the math. So let's write some equations for our boundary conditions. First, we have the electric field boundary conditions. This says the electric field on the left side of the interface in medium one has to equal the electric field in medium two, right up against the interface. Well, we know in medium one, that's the incident electric field plus the reflected electric field. And then in medium two, there is only a transmitted electric field. So that's our boundary condition for the fields, for the electric fields. Let's do the same thing for the magnetic fields. The magnetic field says the total magnetic field in medium one has to equal the total field in medium two right at the interface. Well, in medium one, we have the incident wave plus the reflected wave. And we put the negative sign in here because remember the handedness thing. When we have a backward wave, the direction of the magnetic field is opposite to be consistent with the handedness of a backward wave. Now we would like to put this in terms of the electric fields. So remember the amplitudes of the electric and magnetic fields are related through the impedance. So we can write the incident magnetic field amplitude as the incident electric field amplitude divided by the impedance that the incident wave is in. Likewise, the reflected magnetic field amplitude is the reflected electric field amplitude also divided by this impedance one, eta one. The transmitted magnetic field amplitude is the electric field amplitude divided by the impedance in the second medium, eta two. So now we have two equations, both in terms of the electric fields, but that second one came from the magnetic field boundary conditions. At this point, we want to combine our boundary condition equations into one single equation. So we have our first equation which is which came from the magnetic field boundary conditions and then we have our first equation which came from the electric field boundary conditions well we have an expression to replace 
the amplitude of the transmitted electric field with the incident and reflected electric field amplitudes. And so we can get a single equation just containing the amplitudes of the incident and reflected waves. It's from that equation that we will derive our reflection coefficient. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's derive our reflection coefficient. This is the equation we had on the previous slide. The first thing we'll do is simply split this single fraction into two fractions. Then what I do is I bring to the left all of the reflected terms. So these two terms come to the left. And then we have our E incident amplitude terms. We have two of them. We bring them to the right hand side of the equation. So all E sub R's on the left and all E sub I's on the right. At this point, we have common terms on the left and the right. So on the left, we can factor out E sub R, which is the, the electric field amplitude of the reflected wave. And we can factor out E sub I on the right. Then what we can do is bring this E sub I over to the left. So we're now we're dividing by E sub I. And then we can bring this expression with the impedances over to the right. So we now have this ratio of E sub R over E sub I, and it equals all of these different impedances. Now, what can we do with this expression? Well, let's multiply both the numerator and denominator by eta one times eta two. When we do that, this is the expression that we get. And it turns out E sub R over E sub I, this is the amplitude of the reflected wave relative to the amplitude of the incident wave, that is the very definition of the reflection coefficient. So we've derived our expression for the reflection coefficient. And from this, we can conclude a wave incident on a flat interface. It is fundamentally the impedance, a change in impedance that causes a reflection. We'll also point out there's a minus sign here. That means the numerator can become negative. What does that mean? Well, when the reflection coefficient is negative, that just means there's a 180 degree phase shift of the reflected wave relative to the incident wave. Now for optics, we tend not to talk in terms of the impedance of materials. We talk in terms of its refractive index. And we do that because at optical frequencies, the permeability is very, very small and usually negligible. So if we look at our expression for the impedance in terms of the permeability and permittivity, we can see all the separate terms. But this relative permeability is just equal to one at optical frequencies. So the next thing we can do is factor out this relative permittivity, also called the dielectric constant. So in the numerator, we just have the square root of mu naught over epsilon naught. And in the denominator, the square root of the relative permittivity. It turns out the expression in the numerator is the impedance of free space around 376.73 ohms and there's more digits there. And the square root of the relative permittivity is our refractive index. So the impedance of any medium when we can ignore permeability is the free space impedance divided by refractive index. Now let's look at our equation for the reflection coefficient, which had all impedances. Now let's replace the impedance terms with refractive index. So impedance two is the free space impedance divided by refractive index two. I know the eta symbol looks very similar to the italics N, and so you just have to be careful. Impedance one or eta sub one is free space impedance divided by N one. And then the denominator is the same as the numerator, but the minus becomes a plus. Now in this case, each term has that free space impedance in it. That cancels out. We can drop that from the equation. And we end up with a form very similar that we had on the previous slide for impedance. So what we'll do is we'll multiply the numerator and denominator by N one times N two and the entire equation reduces to that. This looks very similar to our equation when we calculate a reflection coefficient in terms of impedances, but be careful, the ones and twos are swapped over here. 
With impedances, it was eta 2 minus eta 1. With refractive index, it's N1 minus N2. So we have derived the reflection coefficient in terms of refractive indices. Be sure, though, this is only valid when the permeability can be ignored. Let's finish this with a simple example. What is the reflection coefficient for an air to glass interface? This is very common. So the solution is the first thing we need to do is identify refractive indices. So first, the refractive index of air is one. The refractive index of air is really 1.00000, I don't know how many zeros, five or six or something, and then there's a, a three or something like that. So air is slightly above vacuum, but for these calculations, those digits way down there won't make a difference. So we'll just call the refractive index of air one. Refractive index of glass is 1.5. Well, there's lots of different types of glasses and the refractive index can vary. So I just pick a 1.5. That's typical of the glass you'd have in a window in your house or something like that. Something that's fused silica, for example. So once we have refractive indices, then we look at our equation for the reflection coefficient in terms of refractive indices, and we plug in our numbers. So N1 is 1.0, N2 is 1.5, we plug in those numbers. The numerator becomes negative 0.5, denominator is 2.5. So the overall reflection coefficient is minus 0.2. And remember that minus sign is not something magical. That just means when light reflects off of glass from air to glass, there will be a 180 degree phase shift of that reflected wave relative to the applied wave. Now, what is often more meaningful than the reflection coefficient is how much power gets reflected. And so to calculate this, that is the magnitude of our reflection coefficient squared. That tells us the percent power that is reflected. So we plug in our value of 0.2, take the magnitude of that and square it, and we get 0.04. And if we express this in percentage form, that means 4%. So about 4% of light reflects off of glass. That's why when you're looking outside and the lighting is right, you can partially see your reflection in that glass, but you can also see through it. As it becomes darker outside, maybe that reflection becomes more apparent to you because that 4% is now more significant compared to how much of that little light that's maybe coming in from the outside. But it's always a 4% reflection. It's just how much other light is coming in depends how washed out your reflection is. So that's why we have reflection and how we can calculate it. I hope this video was helpful.